Hello again, welcome uh, again to your online sociology lesson. I hope you are well. We are going to continue today to look at some of the educational policies that have happened over the last 30 years um, and how they have impacted upon the education system. We're going to continue today with the 1988 Education Reform Act. OK, so last lesson we looked at the national curriculum. Today we're going to move on to talk about marketization, which is why we've got a picture here of a supermarket aisle, um, although I don't think we've seen supermarket aisles be this well stocked for a couple of months now. Um, if you need to look back over your notes from last lesson about the 1988 Education Reform Act, then please do uh, before you continue watching this video because that's going to be really helpful for you to have in your mind before we kind of move forwards. So if we look at some of the aims of the topic in general, this is the kind of educational policy topic. Um, the three main um, educational policies since the 1980s were the 88 Reform Act um, and then 1997 and 2010 policies as well. We'll look at those later. We need to be able to identify all of them and explain the, sort of the purposes of them. Um, and we need to be able to evaluate the effectiveness of each policy. So we're going to look at the second half of the 88 Reform Act today. Therefore, today's aims are threefold. We are going to be able to define the term marketization. Okay, this is a really important term. And actually, I think it's probably one of my favorites. Um, this whole topic is just fascinating because we get to see just education in a completely different light to what we've ever thought of before. And it's quite controversial. So it's quite an interesting key term for us to learn and for us to be on the lookout for when we are looking at schools, both in our own lives, but also schools kind of around the country. We also have to be able to explain how the 1988 Education Reform Act promoted the marketization of schools and also why, what was the purpose of this? And we are going to link this whole topic to the work of Ball, Bow and Gerwitz, who we have already studied before. So we're going to link it back to something that we already know. Before we go into marketization, let's just have a quick recap um, about the 1988 Education Reform Act and their work on the national curriculum. So if you remember, before 1988 and before the national curriculum came into place, schools had a lot of freedom when it came to selecting what they taught and how they taught it, which was really difficult for the government and sort of the national um, exam boards and you know economy and um, employment, etc., to be able to judge which were the high performing schools and which were the low performing schools, because there wasn't that kind of standard level to measure them by. And so similar to our um, looking at the lemonade uh, stand, national curriculum was all about um, implementing some kind of standard across all schools, whereby all schools were expected, if they were a local authority school, um, were expected to teach the same information, um, teach the same topics and examine students in the same way, which then allowed the government to measure schools against each other and to be able to identify which were the high performing and which were the low performing schools. And this idea of performance and measuring and successful and not successful schools will come into play when we look at marketization. OK, so keep that in mind. The government wanted to have a way of judging and measuring the success of schools. And the national curriculum was one of the ways in which they did that. But there are others as well. So if we move on to looking at marketization, before we look at schools, I want us to have another look at this analogy of the lemonade stand. Last lesson, I got you to think about the idea that you might run um, a little stool, a little stand on the corner of your road selling lemonade. Um, and I got you to think about the fact that maybe down the road from you, there was another group of people who were also selling lemonade, but their process was different to yours and they were using different ingredients. And it was really hard to measure who was better at selling than the other because you were selling completely different items. Um, and therefore, the national curriculum was kind of the idea that we refined and standardized the process of lemonade selling so that we could judge which group was doing it better. 
The idea of marketization, I now want you to think about the fact that in the last week or so, your lemonade business has completely taken off and you are now selling your lemonade, not just in the street corner, but in a supermarket. Okay, you are now packaging up, mass producing bottles upon bottles of lemonade and you're putting it into Tesco, Sainsbury's, Asda, etc. And what you find is that now you are on the shelves of a supermarket, your lemonade is just one bottle across a whole aisle of different brands. You've got loads of people selling lemonade as well as you. And it's really hard for your lemonade to stand out. So what this does is it forces you to begin to market your lemonade, to begin to advertise it and promote it. So you start getting better advertising, you start getting a funky slogan, you start getting customer reviews and you print it on your bottle, the best lemonade I've ever tasted. You get a really good website, you get a great social media presence, you get people like influencers to have photos of them sipping your lemonade and advertising it. You know what I mean? You are marketing your product so that when a customer walks down the aisle and has a lot of different choice, they choose your lemonade. And what this process does, and this is a really um, simple process in capitalist societies, governments like it when businesses have competition. They don't like it. The economy suffers when only one business produces a certain product. So let's say you were the only lemonade producer in the whole of England. You could get away with producing some pretty rubbish lemonade because there's no one else who's going to compete against you. There's no one else who's going to come and take your profits. If we all want lemonade and yours is the only one available, it doesn't really matter if yours isn't particularly tasty because it's the only one we've got. As soon as someone else brings another brand of lemonade in, you've now got competition. Okay, And once there's competition, what that does is that drives up standards. Because in order to be the lemonade seller that makes the most money, you've got to have the best lemonade. Okay, Now, what the 1988 Education Reform Act wanted to do was try and increase the competition between schools. They wanted to create a market situation where similar to a supermarket, similar to a lemonade industry, schools were competing against each other to get the best ratings, to get the best grades, to get the best advertising and ultimately to win the most consumers. Now, consumers are parents, parents who decide where they send their children. Because what the government wanted to do, and this is really, really important, the government wanted to drive standards in schools up. And in the same way that standards of lemonade increase with competition, the idea was that standards of education would increase with competition. So if you increase the competition within schools, you increase the education they offer. If you increase the education they offer, you increase the education of the country. And we have better qualified people in our country because our schools are better. OK, that was quite a long explanation. I do apologize if you want to go back over it, you can. But we will pick that apart in a lot of detail over the next few slides. OK. So let's just recap what I've just said in a bit more simple terms. The aim of the reform, the aim of the Education Reform Act was to get schools to raise their standards and compete against each other for the approval of parents. OK, raise their standards to compete against each other. That's going to become a meme, isn't it? Ridiculous. Um, therefore, creating a market situation. OK, schools, it's a little bit like when you walk down the, the streets um, in a market town, okay, and you've got market sellers being like, you know, two potatoes for a pound and apples for whatever it might be. They're shouting to get your attention. The government wanted to get schools to be loud and shouting to get the attention of parents. That's a market situation. And that whole process is marketization. Okay, so we would define marketization as the process of creating competition between schools 
in order to raise educational standards. Okay, the process of creating competition between schools in order to raise educational standards. That's marketization. So historically, before this act, parents would send their kids to the local school. Yeah, no matter really if that school was good or not, they'd send their kids to the local school. After this Education Reform Act, parents were given a lot more choice over schools because they knew a lot more about schools in their area. And parents might decide to actually start sending their children to a different school, even if it's further away, because they're better informed about that school and they are able to choose more because the schools have been advertising themselves. And therefore, the schools that do the best get the most children in and therefore the schools that do the best survive. OK, so it's all about raising educational standards um, between competition between schools. But how did this happen? Let's have a little bit look uh, into a bit more so there are four main features of marketization of schools and I've helpfully um, put them into a, a table for you and using the acronym SHOP. It makes a lot of sense because we're talking about markets and this idea of competition and that almost that idea of advertising and linking it to a market situation in a supermarket. It makes sense for us to use the acronym SHOP. So when you're thinking about marketization of schools, Think about shops and you will get the following. Schoolie tables, Her Majesty's Inspectors, also known as Ofsted, Open Days and what's called a Parentocracy. And I will break each one down bit by bit. This is really, really important. This is the process that we now take for granted that was introduced in 1988. OK, to start with Schoolie tables. Aside from 2020, because they're not going to have any league tables because they've cancelled GCSE exams in the standard way, um, the government produce league tables of every school in the country showing who has got the best grades, who has made the most progress, thinking about things like Progress 8, which we've covered before, um, and it literally ranks schools based on last year's results. And obviously you can see there are some schools at the top of the table who have the best results and some schools at the bottom of the table. And what parents can do is when their child is in year five or year six and they're applying for secondary school, parents can search league tables for their local area and they can see which schools in the local area have been at the higher end or the lower end of the national league tables. Essentially, which are the best schools for them to send their children to? Now, it goes without saying, schools want to be at the top of the league table and therefore schools want to employ the best teachers. They want to get the best resources and the best results so that they can get up the league table. So this is massively driving competition between schools for who can get the best results every year and be top of that table. So it's a massive, massive factor in competition. The second thing that schools um, are now subject to as a result of the Education Reform Act is inspection and grading from a government body. Ofsted are the group that look at state schools and who judge and rate state schools. Ofsted inspectors are known as Her Majesty's inspectors, the idea that they're working on behalf of Her Majesty's government. So Ofsted were created um, soon after the Education Reform Act, not in 1988 itself, but just soon after, in order to inspect and grade, critically grade schools. And schools can be made or broken by an Ofsted inspection. If a school is rated as outstanding or good, it's going to be plastered all over that school's website and that school's actual you know, banner outside their school gates. If a school is given a rating of inadequate or requires improvement, 
then this is going to be really damaging to the school, to the head teacher. People might lose their jobs. So it's a massive make or break thing, an Ofsted inspection. So again, schools put a lot of time and a lot of effort into getting ready for inspections. And again, that's driving up standards because the inspection looks at previous results, standard of education, all this kind of stuff. So the government is forcing schools to basically improve so they can get a good inspection. As a result of the 88 Education Reform Act, schools were also required to have open days and prospectuses, which both allow parents to have a look at what life in the school is like. So some schools do open mornings, some schools do open evenings, some schools do open days, but basically it's a chance for parents to come around the school, have a look at lessons, have a look at what's on offer, speak to the teachers, speak to some of the pupils that are there and get a feel for what school life is like. But as you know, as a student, open days are always an opportunity for schools to show their best side. So they get all the best um, equipment out, they get all the best presentations out, they get the, the, the smartest dressed students to stand at the door grinning saying welcome to our school. It's a massive PR thing, it's a massive stunt, an advertising campaign where schools advertise to parents, here's our amazing school, come and, come, come and visit our school, come and join our school, come and send your child here. It is a chance for schools to promote themselves and therefore to promote themselves versus their rivals and to get more children into the school. And this is why that's so important. The final element of marketization is what we call parentocracy or power to the parents. Okay, both begin with P, so both are okay, but the key term is parentocracy. Um, if you think back to our learning on meritocracy, that's an idea that a society, the power in society is given to those who earn it or who are most talented. Meritocracy. Parentocracy, anything which got the sort of ocracy at the end is power. So parentocracy is giving power to parents. Parents are the ones, how many times can I say parents in a sentence? Parents are the ones who decide where the children go to school. Yeah, they're the ones who sign the form and submit the form and put the, you know, the request in to send their child to this school. Schools want to win the approval of parents. And this is why it matters so much. The government in 1988 in the Education Reform Act changed the way that schools were funded. Schools are now funded by and large, not entirely, but by and large, by the amount of children they have enrolled in their school. So every child that joins your school is extra money, extra funding. So of course you want to be fully subscribed. You want loads of parents to send their kids to your school because you get more money. But the only way you're going to get parents to sign up to your school is if you have a good open day, a good Ofsted inspection and a great looking on the league table because that's going to be attractive to parents. So in order to get the money, you have to get the parent approval. To get the parent approval, you've got to be a good school. And do you see here where that's driving standards up? The government are increasing competition between schools to drive standards of education up. And ultimately, who benefits from that? You, the children, the people learning, because you get a better education. OK, that's the idea behind the policy. So if we kind of look at this in a whole process, forgive me if this is me going over it one more time and you don't need to listen to this, you can move on, that's fine. But if it's still not quite making sense in your mind, I've got a little flow chart which I'm going to just put up for you so you can see the process step by step. So to start off with, this is a positive kind of flow chart. Let's say a school performs well, and that's what I mean by that is GCSE results, yeah, performance um, in the school is high, progress eight score is good, children make better than average progress compared to their peers, the results are good. As a result of that, they get a high league table ranking because they have performed better than most other schools. 
Because of this and other factors, they get a good Ofsted grading. So Ofsted have come to this school and said, yep, this school is a good school to you to send your children to. Because of this and their good grades, the school has got loads to boast about on open days. So parents come to the school and they can go, oh, did you know we got a really good Ofsted rating? And did you know we got better GCSEs in the school down the road? They've got loads to boast about, which makes them a really attractive school. Because of this, parents are likely to send their children here. And because of that, ching, 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 that's a lot of money. All right. Therefore, because the parents have sent their children to that school and the school has got more funding, that then goes full circle and the school has more funding to buy better resources, more equipment and to pay the best teachers to come to this school. And therefore, the school is more likely to perform well again. And so the cycle continues. High performing schools remain high performing because they continue to get the good funding. All right. On the flip side, let's say a school performs badly over the course of a series of years. OK, it's not just a one off thing, but, uh, you know, over the space of three, four, five years, the school gets worse GCSE results than the school down the road in the same area. As a result of this, they get a low league table ranking. As a result of this and other factors, Ofsted grade them as poor. Okay, rather than saying they're a good school, Ofsted say, actually, this school, your, your child would make less progress in this school than the one down the road. As a result of that, open days are quite embarrassing because it's full of parents asking the school, well, why are your grades not good enough? Why, why are children not making progress in your school? What's going wrong? Which is quite an awkward and embarrassing open day. As a result of that, parents are unlikely to send their children there unless they have to. So the parents that do send their children to this school might be sending them there because they didn't get in elsewhere or because they live locally and haven't got any other means of going to another school. So the school doesn't really get a lot of parent approval and therefore it might not get as much subscription, might not get as many children in the door and therefore might not get as much funding. And therefore, if the school is low on funding, again, it's going to struggle to perform well because it's going to struggle to, to get the best teachers, the best resources. And so the cycle continues. OK, if you think about this in a sort of scientific Darwinian way, like the survival of the fittest, the schools that perform the best do the best. The schools that don't, don't. And the schools that perform the best stay and expand and get more students. The schools that don't perform well enough shut down and close and schools do close you know it's possible for a school to, to be told actually you're not good enough you're closing okay so the idea here is that only good schools survive and that's the that's the government driving standards improving standards of education the best schools survive the longest let's move on a little bit so why did the government bring this in to begin with Quite simply, it was to raise the standards of schools in the United Kingdom to better educate our children. Um, in 2018, the United Kingdom, highlighted in red there, was uh, rose into the top 20 for reading across all different league tables across the whole world. OK, obviously China, Singapore, right at the top. Um, but we are in the top 20. I think we were 14th there um, for the first time in 2018. So that was quite encouraging. And if you have a look at um, over the last few years, we as the United Kingdom have improved over time. So our reading scores, the scores of children ability to read in the United Kingdom um, has improved compared to other countries over time. You see in 2009, we were 25th. And then in 2018, we were 14th. OK, so the standards of schooling in the UK is improving. And many people would put this down to this marketization influence, this this competition between schools to be the best. So many people would say that actually this this whole policy that was brought in 30 years ago is now having a real effect 30 years later. And the, and the UK school system is getting better and we are educating children more effectively and surely that's a great thing because the country that educates the children the best 
has the brightest and the best qualified people in their economy to go on and get the best jobs and give more money back to the economy. So it's a, it's a good thing, yeah? Educating children well is a good thing. However, remember these people, Ball, Bao, and Gerwitz. Now we've studied these people before. We looked at social class. Just a, a one minute overview. These people, um, these guys looked at market forces and parental choice, and they were looking at this idea of marketization. Um, we looked at child A and child B and school one and school two. Quick recap, child A uh, lives in a high earning, high income, middle class family. Child B lives in a low income, working class family. Child A has the means um, and their parents have the transport and the time to drive them to a school further away. Whereas child B's parents both work both leave before they go this child goes to school and they haven't got the the money to pay for public transport so child b is forced to only go to the school down the road now school one which is 0.5 miles away from both children happens to be an underperforming school whereas school two which is eight miles away is an overperforming a very successful school so logic dictates that child A, who has the option of either going to the one down the road or going to the one eight miles away, child A will go to school two because that's a better school and they've got the ability to do that. Child B might want to go to school two, but quite simply can't get there and therefore is forced to go to school one. So what Bulbao and Gerwitz found is that actually the, this whole idea of, of school competition and market forces only really works for middle class parents because middle class parents are the ones who have the time or more time to go to school open days. Middle class parents are the ones who have the ability both in financial means and time means to take their children further away to a higher performing school. Middle class parents were more likely to have the, the connections and the contacts within those schools to find out what life was like for a pupil there. And middle class parents were found to be more likely to have much more of like the attitude towards getting the best education for their children and therefore were more likely to study league tables and actually find out which was the best performing school. Bulbao and Gerwitz found that working class parents were less likely to study league tables, were less likely to know somebody in a high performing school and were less likely to have the ability to have any kind of real choice over where their children went to school. So really in summary, Bulbao and Gerwitz, we know already, talked about sort of the issues of social class, but we can link this really clearly to the marketization of schools and say from their study quite categorically that the marketization of schools works for the middle class parents, but it doesn't seem to work so well for those in the working class. And therefore, if you are driving up standards of education, you are really driving up standards for the middle class, but you might not be driving up standards for the working class. And therefore you might be seeing an increased divide between the middle and the working class, an increased divide in the inequality of education. So this might just further back up their point that the market forces and parental choice really belong to the middle class parents. So in summary, what I would like you to do, and I'm fully aware this was a half an hour video and a pretty long watch, you might have watched it in two sittings, um, but this is the task that I would like you to complete um, when you have the time to do so. To start with, let's just define that term marketization of schools, okay? Can you, can you explain what it means? If you want to, if it will help, link it to those capitalist themes of shopping, consumerism, supermarkets, that idea of walking down the aisle and having, you know, adverts blaring out what the best product is. How are schools like a supermarket? How are schools advertising themselves? 
What was the intention behind the 1988 Education Reform Act's policy to create more competition in schools? Why did they do that? Why do they want to do that? And what have been some of the positive impacts? Talk about how the UK is now rising in international league tables. It seems to be quite a good thing, yeah? Um, explain the four ways that the marketization, marketization of schools happen. That's the SHOP acronym, so explain each one bit by bit. Um, and also I want you to do a little bit of research. I would like you to go to a school website of your choice. Could be your own school or a different school, but find five examples on that website of the school advertising themselves. Okay, look for things like GCSE results, Ofsted reports. If it's a good Ofsted report, it will be all over that website. If it's not a good Ofsted report, they won't include it. OK, either way, the school is going to be trying to show themselves in a positive light, either shouting really loudly about all the positives or being really quiet about the negatives. OK, have a look at how schools market themselves online. And finally, I would like you to link all of this to the criticisms that Ball, Bow and Gerwitz have of the marketization of schools. OK, we've looked at it before, but let's link it to this topic specifically. Use the terms working class, middle class and parental choice in your answer. Thank you. I know that was a lot, but I hope you found that as interesting as I did, because I absolutely love this topic. And um, if you've got any questions, please let me know. Thanks very much.